So uh, we have to transfer the load safely to the ground so that the substructure doesn't fail and the uh, superstructure is not affected in any way. So to transfer that load safely onto the soil, we need to know what type of soil or what type of rock or what is the groundwater table or at what depth you have your hard rock strata underground. So to understand this or to understand the subsoil profile or the properties of the soil under the ground, you need to go for a soil exploration by adopting different methods. There are different methods for soil exploration to understand what is the type of soil under the ground. There are a, many different methods or many different approaches. So you need to understand, first of all, you need to understand once you go to a site, you need to understand what type of soil is there at the surface, what type of soil is there at the uh, at one meter from the ground, at two meters from the ground, at three meters from the ground, and up to 100 meters maybe, depends upon your superstructure. How deep do you think the foundation of the Burj Khalifa is? How deep do you think? Burj Khalifa is, as of now, the tallest structure in the world. Superstructure is 800 plus meters. So what do you think? How deep will be the foundation? What do you think? So the foundation of Burj Khalifa is 164 feet or 50 meters. OK, but the foundation of Burj Khalifa is not actually resting on hard rock strata because it's a, you know, it's desert soil. So you basically have a lot of uh, sandy soil uh, underground. Also, you will not find hard rock strata at a very economical depth. OK, so anyway, 50 meters is not so, not very shallow, of course. So 50 meters is also deep. So Burj Khalifa has uh, gone for a, a piled raft foundation. We will discuss further later what type of foundations are there and what is this particular foundation. But however, now you know that now you understand that it's a combination of shallow and deep foundation. OK, why? Because we do not have a, a very good hard rock strata on which you can rest your piles. OK, so anyway, Burj Khalifa has a foundation of 50 meter depth, correct? How deep do you think the foundation of your house is? See all your houses or maybe a two storied or single storied, two storied or three storied structures, their foundation doesn't go deeper than 10 feet usually, six feet generally, two meters. OK, so we need not have to go much deeper than that because your structural load is pretty less, right? But still, do you construct your house just on the ground surface? No, right? You have to go for a foundation for that, whatever type of foundation let it be. You have to dig and you will place your foundation under the ground, right? Why is that so? Why don't you just construct your house on the surface? Why? Why don't you just keep your house on the surface? So you can save a lot of, you know, excavation uh, costs, uh, further building costs, etc. Right? Why don't you just keep your structure on the ground itself? So the ground soil on the ground surface might not even be compact or consolidated and might not be able to bear that load. Plus, it always rains, uh, floods may be there. You can always, you know, wash away the top surface soil also, right? So the surface soil, you remember the soil profile type A, B, C, D. Soil profile A. So A was usually basically organic content plus weathered rock, isn't it? very finely weathered rock or transported soils, etc., isn't it? So you don't have a good uh, foundation soil on the ground surface itself to transfer your load. Plus, it is always subjected to rainwater, uh, you know, uh, uh, runoff, uh, floods, etc., right? So your load transfer doesn't actually happen. So basically, you will go for if it's a very, uh, you know, uh, single storage structure, let us say, you will go for maybe uh, six feet or two meters, one to two meters of foundation depth or 0.5 meters if it is a wall, etc. Right. But if you have much larger load to, loads to transfer, you definitely have to go deeper, isn't it? And if your foundation is not strong enough to carry such a large amount of load, then you will have to rest your foundation on a rock strata, isn't it? So you will have to bypass your soil profile, soil profile, and you have to dig deeper and you have to find out where does this hard rock strata come. And at that particular depth, you will rest your foundation using pile foundations. Correct? You are aware of this? So you need to know 
what type of soil lies beneath the ground surface to basically design a safe substructure whether it is a pile or a shallow foundation you need to understand the properties of the soil under the ground a structure a substructure a foundation that you build after 5 years it shouldn't settle isn't it you have learned consolidation if it is a clay soil you lay your foundation on clay soil after 5 to 10 years your structure have tilted it it has happened the leaning tower of pisa it has happened what happened there consolidation happened right so they didn't clearly understand what is the type of soil that lie, that was under the ground and what is the properties of the soil that lied underground isn't it if they understood that at that period of time they might have calculated that if the seven story leaning tower of pisa if the seven story structure once it is completed uh, this much amount of load uh, in 25 years the soil is going to consolidate we now we can calculate that isn't it what is the amount of load what is the type of soil what is the permeability of soil what is the coefficient of consolidation how much time it will require for consolidation we can clearly calculate in the current scenario isn't it we, because terzaghi helped us with the uh, one dimensional consolidation theory and all correct so they didn't know that at that period of time and they didn't do any such sort of calculations and they didn't understand that so but now you know what uh, are these properties of the soil that will affect your substructure so now you will what you will do is you will dig into the ground or use any other method to identify what is the type of soil that is lying under the ground and what are the properties of that soil right you will try to understand these so once you understand these then you can construct a safe foundation over which your superstructure is going to come right so that is the need of this chapter and in this chapter we are going to see what are the different methods adopted to find out the properties of the soil beneath the ground surface okay this is the objective of this chapter what is soil exploration so basically it is nothing but you are going to understand or determine the surface and subsurface conditions in the area including position of the groundwater table for construction is that second point valid including position of the groundwater table is that of any relevance to you should you know the position of groundwater table at a site is that necessary is that information important to you swelling and shrinkage if your soil under the ground you are going to lay your foundation on let's say a clay soil with very high montmorillonite content so when the groundwater table rises in the rainy season what will happen your structure is going to rise isn't it because the soil underneath is going to swell and your structure is going to rise isn't it yes and when in the summer season when this water is removed when the groundwater table falls what happens the soil will shrink so your structure will sink isn't it isn't it it's a uh, it's a bit uh, you know i have exaggerated it a little bit the structure is going to not going to you know uh, move up and down just like that but you can observe that the structure is tilting and you can observe a lot of cracks on your structure isn't it it's very unsafe for your structure right so that is also a criteria so position of groundwater table is very important right so in soil exploration further you will get information about the subsoil characteristics stratigraphy of the soil and fluctuations of groundwater seasonal groundwater fluctuations so different methods are adopted for this so why do you need to do this we already discussed it so you need to know what lies under the ground for a safe and economical design of all the substructure elements then you also need to know what lies underneath for remedial measures for existing structures right so if you need to uh, you know rehabilitate you need to underpin a structure you need to uh, you know uh, rectify a tilt of a structure for all those things also you will further need soil exploration you need to know what type of soil lies underground so it is very important because mistakes in that can lead to modifications later then uh, failure of the structure very dangerous situations in the later stage and if your structure tilts or cracks at a later stage then it will you know you will have to spend a lot of money to uh, rehabilitate that structure so you need to make sure that there are no mistakes in soil exploration and you do the lab test very properly and you definitely you have to invest some amount into soil exploration before you start your construction because in india the geotechnical investigation this scenario is very bad as of now the people are not ready to spend much amount maybe if you are constructing a three story structure maybe you will meet your structural designer isn't it 
you will uh, you know give the structure for a structural analysis and you will make sure that all your structural elements are strong enough to carry all those loads but do you think uh, you know do you think people spend same amount of money for geotechnical investigations no usually uh, you know mason at the site will say that okay this site of soil we will dig 1 meter and see what type of soil is there then you will just you know we will keep the foundation at 1 meter depth or 1.5 meter depth it is fine it might have been fine in the previous years so far because there we didn't have much of a uh, constraint for availability of land right we had enough good uh, soils or good land for construction but now as this urbanization is happening and a lot of uh, spaces are being utilized you know uh, the land prices have gone up like anything isn't it so availability of land has gone down so you are forced to construct on whatever soil or whatever plot you already own correct or you are buying a new plot in the city you know the availability of plots or land in the city is very limited now and it is very costly and whatever piece of land you get you cannot demand that i need this particular type of soil in my site right i am going to construct my structure only in uh, you know very dense sandy soil you cannot you know uh, you cannot demand anything like that whatever piece of land or whatever type of uh, soil you get at the site you are forced to construct on that suppose what if your site was previously a landfill so your soil is basically unconsolidated deposit isn't it so you cannot construct a, a structure uh, just on a landfill because later at a later stage your structure is going to consolidate so the actual cost of the uh, geotechnical investigation is usually less than 1 percentage of the total project cost so in the current scenario when you have a lot of uh, you know uh, constraints for the piece of land that you obtain and uh, you are forced to construct on whatever piece of land that you are uh, that is available to you you have to make sure that your structure is going to rest on a very safe piece of land your foundation is going to be safe then only your superstructure is going to be safe right so you have to definitely spend some amount for a proper soil exploration and site investigation understand the properties of the soil at the site and then design your foundation so that at a later stage you don't have to suffer or you know don't have to uh, you know uh, Uh, encounter failure of the structure or need to uh, modify or rehabilitate your structure and uh, you know come up with unforeseen expenses right so usually the cost of the site investigation is just less than 1% of the total project or maximum maybe 5% of the total project cost which is you know a very less amount with that uh, when compared to all these structural analysis and everything right so this comes more and more important as time progresses and uh, good available land uh, is uh, you know there are constraints for that this image i have shown you already maybe uh, in the beginning of your soil mechanics course so i am just you know reminding this again so do you remember this civil engineer makes a mistake it's a catastrophe isn't it it's a disaster it's a mistake will go for a monument instead of a tombstone right so it it is very much relevant here because you make a mistake in you make a mistake in your site investigation and your foundation design you might have to encounter large catastrophes at a later stage so be very careful you have to be very responsible regarding this all right so the few preliminary steps of exploration first one is reconnaissance what is reconnaissance you have seen this in your survey what is reconnaissance so reconnaissance you go to the site the first step of survey is reconnaissance so what do you do in reconnaissance you will see the local topography any excavations or cuttings are there in the site if there are any quarries if if there are any landslides or erosion if there is a, a what is the flooding or drainage pattern at the site and water level in wells and streams etc so these are the few things that you will observe first at the site right then comes the geological study so you will have to understand the nature of deposit type of rock we might encounter falls falls cracks fissures dikes etc then the seismic potential of the area see if you are going to any site in india how do you evaluate the seismic potential of the site as a first hand guide how do you assess the seismic potential of the site so it is classified into different seismic zones india is classified into four different seismic zones which are those zones 
so it starts from zone 2 to zone 5 zone 2 is the lowest seismicity and zone 5 is the highest seismicity okay so which is code specifies this is 1893 part 1 2016 that defines uh, the seismic zonation of india okay so zone 5 is the highest seismicity so where do we have zone 5 in india so northeast northeast india northeast himalayas it's under most of it is under zone 5 and uh, north and central himalayas it is most of it is under zone 4 and some parts are under zone 5 okay some parts of jammu and all uh, it is under zone 5 okay so seismic potential also you have to look at so there are uh, uh, different maps provided uh, maps available like the gsi uh, geological survey of india map survey of india map so you have the uh, you know uh, disposition of different soil types or rock types then uh, topographical sheets or topo maps are also available and soil conservation maps are available so from these maps a first hand idea of what type of soil might be there at your site what type of rock might be there at your site what depth this rock might be available at your site so these ideas you will get a first hand idea you will get from the uh, uh, maps that are already available it might not be correct exactly correct for a specific site but you can get a rough idea right then another thing is aerial photography so some uh, you know if you look at aerial photographs you can relate it to actually types of plant growing at the area if you look at a you know a mango orchard you can identify a mango orchard from an aerial photo right or you can identify a coconut orchard or rubber plantations these things you can actually very easily identify from an aerial photograph isn't it so uh, you can actually if you are an expert you can relate what type of crops or plantations grow on what type of soil right so you can actually correlate the plant growth to geology land formations etc so for that you have to have a very good knowledge in the basic geology geomorphology agriculture and hydrology so if you are uh, you know an expert in these uh, you can you know have a rough idea when you look at an aerial photograph you will be having an idea about what type of plants are growing in that place and what type of soil might be lying underground so this aerial photograph what is that where is this place the bottom right one have you seen the structure yeah it's our camp so if you are an expert you can identify what types of plants these are from the aerial photograph and you can actually relate it to okay this is the type of plant this type of plant grows in so and so types of soil right so like that you can correlate okay if you are an expert in all these above fields geology geomorphology agriculture and hydrology so precise information on these three topics are very much mandatory for a safe design of a foundation so you have to identify order of occurrence and extent of soil and rock strata what is the order of different soil uh, types under the ground and what is the extent of that maybe the first one meter it is organic soil next one meter to 1.5 meters it is loose sand 1.5 meters to 2.7 meters suppose it is clay so like that you need to understand what is the order of occurrence so the, what is the order of occurrence here organic uh, sand uh, clay etc right so you have to understand that order of occurrence and what is the extent i told you 1 meter 1 meter to uh, 2.7 meter etc 1.5 meter 1.5 meter to 2.7 meter like that what is the extent of occurrence of these different soil or rock strata this you need to be able to understand then nature and properties of the soil and these rock form formation so you need to understand the properties of the soil at each of these different depths so what you will do is you will uh, take samples from the site you will take it to the lab and you will test it for different properties and you will you know make a chart of it right so you need to understand the nature and properties of the soil and rock formation what is the cohesion of that soil what is the angle of internal friction of that soil what is the natural water content of that soil what is the density of that soil all these information are very much necessary inputs into designing your foundation calculating the strength of the soil calculating the settlement parameters of the soil what is the consolidation rate of the soil you need to calculate all these for figuring out a safe and economic foundation then of course location of the groundwater and its seasonal variation so uh, importance of groundwater we already discussed you guys are very well aware of it right so these are the precise informations that you need to understand from a uh, good 
uh, site investigation and soil exploration. So there are different exploration methods used. So some of them are as follows. These are the three major classifications of soil exploration methods. One is direct method, one is semi-direct method and the other one is indirect method. Direct method means you know you are directly in contact with the soil, you can touch and feel the soil, you can see the soil. So that is a direct method, test pit, trial pits and trenches as you can see here. A person is uh, digging a, a pit here. So you can see what is the disposition of different soil strata in this pit. You can definitely easily identify, right? You can collect the sample, you can touch the sample and you can feel the sample. Basically at a site, if you go to a site, how will you basically understand what is the type of soil there? Maybe at, from a depth of, see here you can see this person has dug up to almost two meters. And I'm going to collect some soil from this. Can you see my, my mouse moving? I'm going to collect some soil from here. Okay, and I need to identify whether it is sand or clay. How can I do that? Basic identification from the site. First hand knowledge. How do I identify whether it is sand or clay? You can make threads up to 3 mm size, isn't it? If it is clay, not necessarily 3 mm. If it is a mix of sand and clay, maybe still you can roll it into threads, isn't it? If it is purely sand, definitely you cannot do that. Even if it is more than 50 percentage sand also, it will be very difficult to roll it into threads, isn't it? So how much, you know, uh, what is the consistency when you add water? How does the consistency change or how does the how much you can deform the soil based on that you can have a first hand idea of what is the soil at that site isn't it okay anyway coming back to this so there are different direct methods like test pits trial pits and trenches as you can see here there is a trial pit here this is a test pit here trenches i will show you then there are semi direct methods called boring have you heard of boring in soil have you heard of boreholes boreholes are small uh, diameter uh, cylindrical cuts or holes made in the soil so that you can uh, explore the soil. You can identify what type of soil lies underneath. So that is a semi-direct method. Maybe you cannot go into that uh, borehole and you know touch and feel the soil or collect the soil sample with your hand. So it's a semi-direct method, okay, borings. Then there are indirect methods. So that is uh, soundings or penetration tests and geophysical methods. We will see this geophysical methods like, uh, you know, uh, uh, seismic refraction test, electrical resistivity test, etc., or penetration test. You need not, you know, you are, you will not be collecting any soil samples in indirect methods. You will not even, uh, might not even see the soil uh, with your eyes, but you know, you can identify what type of soil lies underground. So those are uh, the methods are direct methods, semi-direct methods, and indirect methods. Okay. Direct methods, as I told you, test pits, trial pits, or trenches. So it is open and accessible. It can be used for all types of soil. So usually you will go for direct methods if the depth of exploration is less than three meters or maybe maximum five meters. So uh, from a uh, test pit, trial pit, or trench, you can collect a disturbed or undisturbed samples. What are disturbed and undisturbed samples? We had discussed this earlier. We will see that in detail in this uh, particular topic. But anyway. Uh, basic information that you have what are disturbed or undisturbed samples so undisturbed samples are samples which have retained the soil properties at the site as closely as possible right and disturbed samples uh, there are two types of disturbed samples representatives and non-representative uh, that we will see later but disturbed samples are samples which are as the name suggests disturbed there will be some uh, distortion in its uh you know uh, some alteration in its density, water content, uh, you know, arrangement, etc. All right. So both types of samples can be obtained from direct methods. OK. So usually adopted for minor structures only. OK. So here you can see a, a test pit, trial pit and test pits. So it's very simple. You just dig into the ground and on the top left figure you can see the different soil types the color of the soil is changing can you see here this is more of black in color why is it black in color there might be a lot of organic content there isn't it you can see there are some organic content there are some roots etc right so you can see soil profile a b maybe you can see that right can you see that so for minor structures as we discussed earlier maybe for your house uh, you might go for uh, 6 feet to 15 feet something less than that right so you can see here so you can actually see what is the type of soil here right similar case here then you can also have trenches as you can see here see very long trenches and you can directly go into the trench and you can 
feel the soil or collect the samples and you can make uh, you know you can make a, a log of what are the types of soil and its variation throughout this trench length right these are trenches so these three are direct methods trial pits test pits and trenches very simple method less than 3 meters depth and usually for minor structures then comes our borings or semi direct method so here when the depth of exploration is large you will usually go for boring method so the definition is nothing but making or drilling bore holes into the ground with a view to obtain soil or rock samples from specified or known depths it is called boring so you you are going to make a small diameter hole in the ground uh, from which you can collect soil or rock samples from any depth necessary so this process is called boring okay there are different methods of boring auger boring auger and shell boring wash boring percussion boring and rotary boring okay so we will see all these different types in detail here okay so first one is auger boring so generally adopted up to 6 meter depth i'll first i'll show you the figure so these are different types of augers used so there are different types of many different types of augers so you have a post hole or i1 auger helical auger gravel auger dutch auger uh, open and closed spiral uh, augers uh, float spiral shoe barrel auger so there are different types of augers so what you will do is you can see a handle here can you see my mouse so you can see that there is a handle here you can simply hold it with your hand insert it into the soil and you will rotate this that's it as simple as that so that is basic augering can you see here or types of augers see a helical auger here right so you can just use this handle and drive this into the soil again different types of augers helical augers so you can see this guy he is you know driving the auger into the ground and see there is there are videos for this i have uploaded it in ample you can uh, watch the videos in ample or you can download and watch it or you can go for any youtube link and watch more videos if you are interested okay a video has been uploaded in ample yeah so you can uh, the whole ppt and uh, uh, few videos i had uploaded in ample so you can watch uh, those videos after this class okay whatever topics we are covering in the class those videos you can watch after the class okay auger auger boring wash boring all those videos i had uploaded in ample so this is uh, the method of augering so it's a very simple method and uh, it's usually adopted for up to depths of 6 meters in soft soils which can stand unsupported okay what are the types of soils that can stand unsupported what do you mean by that without any casing you can drill into the ground right if you go to the beach and if you are trying to dig a hole maybe let us say uh, you are trying to make a hole of 50 cm in depth half a meter a uh, bore hole you are going to make in beach sand maybe in the wet sand you will be able to do that but in the dry sand dry beach sand the more you dig the more the soil caves in isn't it you keep on digging and the soil just slides into the hole correct so it cannot stand unsupported so clay soil due to its cohesion sometimes it can stand unsupported right so usually you will adopt this method in the case of soft soils which can stand unsupported basically soils with clay content right so it it can be used uh, with or without a casing pipe if the soil cannot stand and supported you can see here this guy is driving it inside a casing can you see that can you see my mouse you can see that he is putting the auger into a casing because he has used this casing so that the soil doesn't cave in right the soil doesn't cave in so he has he has used this casing and he has put the auger inside and he is rotating it so that he can drill the soil correct so sometimes it is used with a casing pipe and uh, it can be hand driven like this or it can be power driven also it can be done with a machine as well okay so it is very convenient for uh, partially saturated sands silts uh, medium to sit, uh, stiff uh, cohesive soils and usually this is adopted for soils above ground water table okay so just imagine you are doing this you are putting this helical auger into the ground and you are rotating it and you are raising this back so what happens there will be some soil uh, in between these uh, spirals isn't it right so that type of sample the soil sample that you are collecting it's a disturbed sample or undisturbed sample 
it's a disturbed sample and if it is a very sandy soil by the time you raise this out of the casing the soil might even fall back inside right that is why i told that it is usually adopted for the uh, types of soil that i just mentioned partially saturated sands silts and medium to stiff cohesive soils or clay soils all above groundwater table you can't simply you know you might be able to drill it into the groundwater table but you will not be able to raise it and retrieve any sample because the sample will get mixed with water and once you raise your helical auger uh, it will have only the auger you will not have any soil in between if there is a lot of groundwater isn't it so it is usually adopted in the cases of shallow foundations highways and borrow pits so it's process as i have mentioned is very simple you keep it vertical you press it down and rotate it so in these annular spaces here between these spirals the samples are uh, samples will be collected and once you raise it you can get a disturbed sample and you can identify first hand identification of what type of soil will be available there okay that is auger boring then comes auger and shell boring you can see that there is a shell here you can use auger and shell boring uh, generally when there are soils which uh, cannot stand unsupported all right like loose sands or under the uh, water etc if you have soils which cannot stand unsupported then what you will do is you will insert a casing like this i have done you can see here okay you can insert a casing or a shell Uh, that is where this term comes from you will insert a shell and then you will do the boring so once uh, that boring process is complete once you put in your uh, auger and drill it you remove that drill then you can put in a sand baler okay you can insert that and retrieve the soil underneath okay so it's usually a heavy duty pipe with a cutting edge and also you will use sinker bars for added weight if the soil is pretty hard then you will have to Uh, you know you cannot do that drilling with your hand you might have to add further load to break into that soil and dig deeper so for that you will use sinker bars okay so what you can do is here as you can see here you will simply raise this you will have a sinker bar here on the top uh, an extra added weight so you will raise this you will drop it into the ground okay as you can see here inside that casing you have an auger like this okay so you will raise this and you will drop it into the ground and once the soil here is pulverized you can insert your sand baler and extract that soil okay so basically the process starts with augering you will start rotating this but once this rotating the auger becomes very tough what you will do is you will insert this casing and the sinker bars you will raise this and drop it so that you can pulverize you will break the soil under this under the bore hole and then you will rotate the auger and dig further okay usually this is hand operated till 25 meter depth and it can also be machine operated till 50 meters depth of boring okay so that is auger and shell boring all right so generally this is adopted when the soil cannot stand on its own unsupported and when the soil caves in in that cases you can go for auger boring with the shell so it is called auger and shell boring or when uh, augering dif uh, becomes difficult okay so this auger boring it is adopted in uh, uh, the types of soil that i have mentioned the soil that can stand unsupported and you can easily with, uh, retrieve that samples but if that process becomes hard due to uh, caving in of the soil or harder soil strata you will go for a auger and shell boring okay especially with sinker bars if it is getting more and more difficult to dig in okay then comes wash boring so in auger and shell boring also you can collect your soil samples so you will pulverize the soil at this uh, base then you will insert your sand baler or the casing and you will extract the soil sample so the soil sample obtained is actually disturbed or undisturbed in this case it will be disturbed then comes wash boring so look at this figure very carefully i'll explain this so it's a very fast and simple method so this can be used in all soil types except gravelly and boulderous soil okay you can go for sandy soil you can go for clay soil you can go for uh, sandy clay clay sand pure sand pure clay any type of soil provided you have no gravel and boulders okay you can go for wash boring okay so look at this figure very carefully i'll explain the process So look at the figure 
you can see here there is a casing pipe under the ground there is a casing pipe you have inserted a casing so whether the soil can stand unsupported by its own or not doesn't matter so you have a casing here you have a casing pipe and inside that you have a hollow drill road you can see this road in the center this is a hollow drill road then at the end of that drill road you have a chopping bit or a sharp edge okay so through that hollow drill road what you will do is you are going to pump water at a very high pressure okay there is a water sump here and there is a settling tank or tub here so you have a suction pipe here as you can see so from this sump you will suck water in and using this pump you will push this water at very high pressure through this hollow drill road okay so you through this hollow drill road water is pumped at a very high pressure and here you can see there is a winch and a rope so you can raise this and you can drop this here is a pulley here supported everything supported on a tripod so you have a pulley here so you will raise this and you will drop this okay so what happens you have a very sharp chopping bit at the bottom you have a hollow road through which water is uh, pushed in at very high pressure so this water and this chopping bit once you raise this and drop it it's a continuous action right so this water at high pressure and the chopping bit is going to act together and it is going to pulverize the soil at the base right and once this water and this chopping bit pulverizes that soil this comes up as a slurry as you can see this water at the high pressure and the churning bit is going to break down the soil here and this comes back to the surface as a slurry as you can see here through this casing this slurry will come back up here and it will dep be deposited inside this settling tank and from that settling tank the water will be coming coming back to the sump again which will be circulated again so it will be a continuous process okay as you can see here is that clear is the process clear i hope it is clear so what do you think the samples collected are are you going to collect any sample in this will you be able to collect a sample from this no right just looking at the color of the slurry that is coming out the slurry that is collected here when the color of that slurry changes you can understand that okay the soil strata has changed i have encountered a new soil strata when the color of the slurry changes isn't it that is the only thing you are going to understand from this okay so what but once you have reached a particular depth let us say maybe 2 meters depth you have reached you can stop this process you can suck out this water you can clean the borehole and from the base of the borehole you can maybe retrieve a sample later okay you can retrieve a sample later after the process is complete and the borehole is cleaned but during the process of wash boring you cannot retrieve a good representative or undisturbed sample okay the samples that you are collecting in this method is basically useless you can just see the color of the slurry and understand that the strata has changed at a particular depth okay so that is wash boring can be used below water table and in all soil types except rocks okay so water table doesn't matter because anyway you are going to use water to jet and flush out the soil slurry next method is percussion drilling so this is adopted when you have gravelly or rock strata earlier any type of soil except gravelly or bouldery uh, soil strata you will go for wash boring but if you have gravelly or rocky strata you have to go for percussion drilling isn't it so in this case you will use a, a heavier drill bit or heavier and sharper drill bit it is called a churn bit so that is suspended from a drill rod or cable and lifted and dropped inside a vertical hole it looks pretty much like this itself but you have a heavier uh, drill bit here and it is raised and dropped from a larger height so what happens at the at the base what happens the rock or the gravels at the base due to the heavier churn bit uh, it gets pulverized isn't it so once it is pulverized then you form it into a slurry by providing water and that slurry is bailed out using a sand baler or a sand pump so this is not usually adopted in loose sand because it's not necessary and the process will be very slow in the case of plastic clays if it is a very loose sand maybe you can go for wash boring itself isn't it because loose sand if you Uh, use a uh, water jet at high pressure itself that will be uh, disturbed and you can easily remove that soil isn't it so if the soil is gravelly or rocky then you have to use a heavier drill bit and you will raise it from a, a larger height and drop it so that you 
pulverize you hammer it and pulverize it into a powder form then you will uh, uh, flush it out using water you will provide water at the base so form that into a slurry and it is removed using a uh, baler or a sand pump so this is percussion drilling as you can see here this is manual you can also use it using a winch setup as i showed earlier in the case of wash boring very simple uh, method okay same figure applies here similar figure similar figure but you need not use a, a water jet at the end but instead you will use a much heavier churn bit and you will raise it and drop it so that the soil here is pulverized then you will uh, you know mix it with some water and it is uh, pumped out okay that is percussion drilling so it can be manual and use also you can use now nowadays we have uh, heavy machinery is for this wash boring percussion drilling rotary drilling for all these we have equipments like this as you can see here okay it can be done manually or using this advanced machineries then comes my rotary drilling so rotary drilling as the name suggests your drill bit or the churn bit is going to rotate okay so this is a fast method of boring in the case of rock formation so this is also similar to the past two methods you have a tripod or a equipment that you can uh, use you can insert it into the soil and you can in this case you are going to rotate your drill bit okay last two cases you, you just used to uh, one was uh, wash boring you used to uh, spray water at a very fast rate and the second one percussion drilling you raised and dropped it so that you can pulverize the soil and in rotary drilling what you're going to do is you're going to ro rotate your churn bit or drill bit and you're going to bore into hard rock formations all right so you will have a hollow drill bit fixed to a hollow drill rod and that is continuously rotated by connecting it to a machinery so usually a drilling fluid like bentonite is used so that no casing is required why bentonite suppose you are drilling into soils uh, which cannot stand unsupported that means sand, sandy soil for example they have large void ratios i mean uh, they have large voids so that they cannot stand by itself so what you do is uh, when you uh, circulate bentonite bentonite is a type of highly swelling clay it can swell up to 400 times so when you mix it with water and you rotate uh, and you you know circulate it in a, a borehole this bentonite is going to sit in all those voids and it is going to sit there and swell right so this bentonite once you mix it with water it is going to swell and once you you know circulate it inside a, a borehole this bentonite is going to sit in the, all those voids and it is going to stabilize that cut or stabilize that borehole that is why you use bentonite so here usually a drilling fluid that is adopted in most of the uh, boring or drilling methods are bentonite so it also has that uh, cooling property as uh, you mentioned but the primary uh, function is to stabilize and uh, prevent the usage of a casing okay so uh, due to that uh, this method or uh, bentonite uh, as a drilling fluid it is not used in porous deposits because suppose your uh, soil is highly porous or soil is uh, you know rock is very highly porous and uh, it has a lot of fissures in it in that case how much ever uh, bentonite you pump into the soil it will simply go and flow into all these fissures or cracks and just keep on filling that it will not serve the purpose so generally uh, bentonite is not adopted for porous deposits and uh, uh, coming back to rotary drilling so the you fill the you fix this hollow drill bit and uh, at the bottom of the hollow drill rod then you keep on rotating it and to stabilize the cut you will continuously circulate bentonite into it so uh, if you need to require if you if you uh, need to uh, retract uh, soil samples or rock samples what you can do is you will go for uh, sharper drill bits or diamond drill bits and you will insert uh, core barrels so these these are these core core barrels are long cylindrical hollow tubes with a diamond bit at the base okay this you will keep in contact with the rock and you will keep on rotating it at very high speed so what will happen the uh, core uh, can actually the core will actually be driven down once it is rotated the diamond bit will uh, cut into the uh, rock and that uh, rock will be filled into the core barrel once you retract this core barrel and open that you can see that there is a uh, rock core sample inside okay so uh, uh, 
these core barrels are used in rotary drilling when you want to retrieve a rock sample or rock core from the ground so for large diameter holes you will go for short drilling and uh, uh, here you can see this is a rotary drill you can see this is a hollow uh, drill road and this is at the bottom is a hollow drill bit okay so this is kept on in contact with the ground and this is rotated at very high speed so this will uh, move down this will move down and keep on drilling into the soil so this is a short drill as you can see here if you are having a larger diameter hole you can uh, use the short drill to uh, make several uh, holes in inside that large bore hole and drill deeper so here you can see a, a you know live action of a person carrying out rotary drilling as you can see here you have a casing you have inserted it into the ground and you are uh, this machine will rotate it at very high speed and you can retrieve rock core samples if required soil investigation report this we will see in the next class i'll just show you a figure of a uh, core as you can see here can you see this so this sampler it's called a split spool sampler we will see that later but just because i mentioned a rock coring method here so uh, that rock cores will also be uh, retrieved like this but at the bottom of this you will have a diamond bit or a very uh, strong drill bit so this will be kept in contact with the rock and it will be rotated at a very high speed okay it will be rotated at a very high speed using a diamond bit or a very hard uh, drill bit uh, in rotary drilling and the rock sample will be filled inside like this so this you can retrieve it outside and once you open that core you can see your rock core sample collected inside like this okay is that clear all right so we'll wind up for today thank you